Welcome everyone to an ethical corporation uh, by Reuters events webinar. I'm Ed Long and I head up our North American events at Ethical Corp. Uh, today we have an important debate with leading industry experts on delivering a new normal, um, financing this, a sustainable future. Could the COVID-19 pandemic spur a green recovery? The push for business to help deliver a low carbon economy, adapt to the changing climate and understand the potential financial and social risks of climate change has never been greater. How do we build back better uh, and succeed in delivering a sustainable future? I'm delighted to welcome today a fantastic panel of experts uh, for the webinar. Uh, today joining us, we have Rebecca Marmot, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever, Davina Rankin, Chief Financial Officer at Waste Management, Terry Heyman, Chief Financial Officer at World Gold Council, um, Klaus Egard, uh, Chief Financial Officer at Mars. Uh, and today, the session will be moderated by Hello Bank Jorgensen, who's the CEO and founder of Competent Boards. Uh, thank you all for joining us, everyone, and a special thanks to World Gold Council who are partnering with us on this webinar. Uh, today's one hour webinar will be in the form of a panel discussion. On the right hand side, you'll be able to see a, a box where you can post your questions. Please do post your questions throughout the, throughout the session and we'll aim to get those answered across the hour. Uh, and it's my pleasure to hand over to Hella who will get the discussion underway. Well, thank you so much, Ed, and welcome everybody. I hope you're safe wherever you are. I think I heard from Ed that we had a lot of people on, on this webinar. Um, and it is a very, very important webinar, if, if I can say it myself, delivering a new normal and how to finance that sustainable new normal. I know a lot of people say, oh, can we just go back? Can we just go back to, to how we were? But really, I think most of those of you who are listening right now, you want to see how can we actually use this, as Churchill was saying at some point, not waste a crisis. Uh, how can we build back better? And that is what we're going to discuss today. Um, I have with me three CFOs um, and two CS CSOs, um, if I may say so. I, I know that that seems a little bit strange, um, but it's because when we had our prep call, Terry was actually saying to me that he was responsible also for sustainability. Um, so, so Terry, maybe I can start with you because I think what's important is to figure out what is the role of both the CFO, what is the role of the CSO, and for all of you listening, I also want for you to see what's your role in this, um, because I think this takes all of us. I don't think that this is something that one company, even though those company we have on today are, you know, can really have a huge impact, but this is not something that one company can just take on. This takes all of us. But, but Terry, for your, you know, as a CFO um, and a CSO, what, what is the role? as you see it, to get back, but build a, a, a better uh, future and perhaps taking into sustainable development goals, perhaps taking into climate discussion. Sure. Well, thank you, Heather, and thanks to Ethical Corp for, for hosting this discussion today. Really looking forward to being a part of it. I, I think what we're seeing now around Build Back Better is really a continuation and an ex exacerbation of the discussion around what the role of business is. And what we've seen is reshaping and reframing business roundtable and others around businesses serving the needs of stakeholders, I think is being laid out plain and clear for all to see right now. The, the debates that have happened over the past few weeks and months around what constitutes essential businesses and more broadly, really, what is the purpose? What is the role that business plays as part of global society? I think, I think are really at the fore and are going to continue at the fore. At least I, I hope that's the case. And look, I think the CFO has a really important role to play in helping to ensure that their companies continue to access capital and continue to be able to finance the activities. And it's going to get increasingly hard to access capital if your company doesn't isn't able to clearly uh, articulate the role it plays in, in serving society's needs. I think we're going to see more and more investors who I think have an, a really important role to play in making capital allocation decisions, put funds towards those businesses that cannot just demonstrate how they are financially sustainable, 
but also how they are more broadly sustainable to the benefit of society. I think we've been heading in the direction, and as I said, I think it's just been exacerbated by, by COVID. And I think there's a really important role for CFOs to play. Part of the reason that I do take that dual role of CFO and, and CSO is recognizing the intersection. Um, to some extent, they are still coming from historically different worlds, but increasingly they're getting closer aligned. If an organization doesn't have uh, the values that support long-term value, it's just not going to be around over the long term. And, and the CFO is in a great position to help make sure that the value is linked to the underlying values uh, and the CSOs really have a role to play in that as well. Thanks, Terry. Um, so, Rebecca, I would love to hear your, your feedback if, if you agree on that. But perhaps also for you, if we think about now with COVID-19, it seems this has been shining this light into, a, unfortunately, from some a dark room where we suddenly start seeing the cracks, being that in terms of the supply chain, um, we've been so efficient, et cetera. Uh, and suddenly we see that, oops, there's something that's that's not working as it should all the places, but also in relation to consumers. Right now, we, we probably unfortunately have a lot of people out there that don't have so much money. And if we think about building back and Unilever is a fantastic company, how your role in both thinking about it from the consumer's point of view, but also to your suppliers. I know this is a huge question, but I also know that that, that you're able to take that on. So your thoughts. Thanks very much, Heller, and, and thank you to everybody um, for joining the webcast this afternoon. I know there's been such a different webinar during this past 12 weeks, so it's, it's great to be on such an interesting panel. Um, so I think you covered a, a number of issues there that are really pertinent to Unilever. When we, um, when we started to tackle and approach the COVID crisis, for us as a consumer goods company, um, it meant really being very structured and disciplined at how we organize the business. So we saw huge changes um, in supply. Different countries were in lockdown at different times, with different protocols being observed in different countries. And for us, one of the most important things that we had to do was to ensure that our staff who were working in the manufacturing facilities, so not able to work from home, like I'm very lucky to be able to do, but actually in the factories working, were protected and able to carry on producing essential everyday items that we need around the world to wash our hands, the number one most important thing during the COVID crisis, uh, disinfectants, essential foods, etc. So I think we also saw during that time, you were talking about consumers, such a shift in demand for in the kind of portfolio um, that Unilever offers. So as you can imagine, you know, not very much going on in an out of home ice cream business, a huge, huge, unprecedented demand for soap, for sanitizer, hygiene products for essential nutritious foods so from a supply chain perspective for us that meant being able to be very agile and very quick in changing for example deodorant manufacturing lines into producing sanitizers it meant for us being really um able to make very uh, split moment decisions about where we could allocate what we had available you know what did we make available commercially to retailers but even more importantly what could we do in the communities that we're working with help with the ministry health are huge requirements that they had in place. I think when you talk about the, the livelihoods of suppliers, one of the key things that we do at Unilever all the time is when we look at our business, we take a value chain approach. So we put sustainability at the heart of our business making decisions. So if you think for us, that means from the farmer in the field through to the manufacturing of the product, through to how we market and sell that product and the power of our brands to be able to influence people's behavior in a positive way, through to where that product's sold and then where, and where it's disposed of. And if you put a sustainability lens across all of that, you know, it makes a huge difference to the way they're operating. So we realized very quickly that, you know, in the link with, with finance um, that, that Terry was talking about, you know, we had to use the, the strength of our balance sheet in a very positive way over the past 12 weeks. So for example, we extended half a billion in credit to our small scale retailers because we know for them that actually immediate cash flow was the most important thing. We immediately changed the payment terms for, particularly for the small scale suppliers, but all suppliers, to make sure that we were able to, to, to help them to keep that business moving. And I think, you know, to your last point, when we when we think about what, what does the world look like as we move forward, you know, I don't think any of us now believe that we're in a post-COVID world, you know, that this is, is, is going to be the new normal. 
So when we're looking at Unilever about what that means, we really want to make a very positive um, uh, intervention to not just going back to the way that we used to do things and recovering back into you know, a world that was really dominated by carbon intensive industry, single use disposal, huge growing inequality. I think we all in business and government and society have to be much more joined up and look at what we can do in terms of reinvention. And you know, for us, I think there's this three big things. The first is around is around climate change and around regenerating the planet. You know, we've seen, I think, much greater reliance and interest on science because of the pandemic. And we need to make sure now that you know we we heed those warnings that the scientific community have been talking about for many years around the importance of climate change and the environmental degradation. You know, we've got to make sure that as we build back and rebuild and reinvent the world, that we limit temperature in line with the Paris Agreement and indeed if possible to, to 1.5 because otherwise you know, the first foundation that, that we want to provide for everyone in this new in this new normal won't be there. I think the second point is around prioritizing those who really need help the most. I think we've seen that, that COVID has disproportionately impacted those communities around the world that are perhaps sometimes less able to deal with it. And it's always the hard, you know, the hardest hit, but always ones that lack the, the opportunity to be able to get at financial uh, and, and human resources when they need it the most. And then I think lastly, and, and you've touched on it, Hella, um, is really ensuring that there is a much greater shift towards a multi-stakeholder model. And that's something that Unilever's talked about for a long time, but ending the, you know, the obsession with short-term economic growth at the expense of everything else and actually building back in a way that is much more inclusive and really looks to the interests and respects and builds in the interests of a whole host of different stakeholders, because ultimately that will be a better world for everyone. It will help to uplift those um, who have been impacted most severely in this in, in this growing inequality that we see, uh, and at the same time build back in a way that you know doesn't just stop harm to the planet, but actually regenerates the planet. Thanks, Rebecca. So, Klaus, I'm going to turn to you, and and the questions are starting coming in. Um, Mario uh, asks here: CFOs are notoriously known for cuts and downsizing <laughs> in crisis times. What would be really different different this time? But I want to I want to kind of like phrase that also. So you as Mars, kind of like are you are you looking now to step on the gas and let's say let's do more in terms of ESG sustainability and gas in terms of but but or are you are you looking to to say stop 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 this is going to cost money um you know, let's let's put put a break on 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 initiatives um and and perhaps if you can look at it both from right now in the short term but also look into the future will we see more esg sustainability as part of the business or or was this it yeah. oh great thank you and and thank you for for having me on the panel and uh, it's great to be with the with all of you, um, and, and like everybody else, I hope you're all well out there in this unprecedented, weird situation we are, we're finding ourselves in. Um, so, so at Mars, and, you know, we, we may be you know, well, less well known than, than others, as at least the company name. We're a privately held company owned by the Mars family, and you know, it's not just about M&Ms and the Mars bar, but actually uh, our bigger business is the, in, in pet care, where we have a lot of pet food businesses, and also two and a half thousand veterinarian hospitals around, uh, you know, the world, and uh, we also operate in the food category. So many of our businesses are also very essential to this to this crisis. And you know, as the private you know company have put our you know our principles uh, you know and purpose at the forefront of the way we've been been driving our business. And, you know, I think we have many similarities, of course, between our businesses not just in categories we sort of serving but also the, the culture and the philosophy of, of of making sure that we could continue to safely you know produce and deliver and and, and service and you know, consumers and pets you know out there in the you know in the world um i think um when we look back and i understand this crisis here is unprecedented you know in many you know ways um we always, there's, you know, our inboxes are loaded with reports about how everything is going to be different tomorrow. And, 
and, and that's always a great opportunity to to innovate of course i think the good news though is that when we look back um, most of the time it's really the the trends that are um that are most pertinent to the situation where the, in they will accelerate it's it's not it's rare that there's a there's a there's a, there's a, a great new dawn out there but more we see accelerating trends and i i'm pleased to see that the esg agenda has gained so much uh, publicity during this this crisis as well. yes the the social society part of it has clearly been upweighted and i think it's a disaster we're going to go maybe whatever 10 years back in time now in terms of levels of poverty in the world and clearly a huge responsibility in all of us to, to try and accelerate that back but so i think it is great that we will see a number of these trends uh take a much bigger part of that recovery phase you know we're going in we are looking at like everybody else i guess uh, we have a, an uncertain recovery period ahead, ahead of us with the worst recession uh, in, in close to 100 years, on, you know, thrown on top of it, and then there will be, you know, post consumers feeling or people feeling more safe, post vaccine, uh, post recession, maybe a new recovery or a new norm. Um, we can all predict when it will be, but 22 onwards. And um, and you know, to your question, uh, am I stepping on the brake or are we pressing the accelerator? I'm not going to go down the gas. Um, we we. You know, in the end of the day, as a CFO, you know, you have to you have to do both things. I mean, without preserving, you know, liquidity and making sure your business can continue to run, by the way, produce, sell, uh, you know, products, you know, there is going to be no funds to, uh, to do all the great things that we all have a role to play. And so, you know, we, we've got to got to take a measured approach, you know, to these things and um, our commitment to the ESG agenda, though, has not changed. It's facing some delays because, you know, there are things we just have not been able to do for three or four months, and like with many other things in our businesses. But the, but the commitment is is unchanged, and I am pretty sure that the process we are going through right now, which we call, you know, sharpening our our strategy, which is really looking at all of our strategic priorities. And, deciding which ones do we need to accelerate on which ones do we need to you know stop or pause because they don't make sense right now uh, based on where consumers are and what's possible out there and which ones do we need to rethink and um, i'm very convinced that we will end up with you know the the broader esg agenda being in the accelerator you know bucket um, and and uh, our planning issues of 50, 50 billion pieces of individual wraps and bags and whatever else um, has not gone away. Uh, yes, it, protect, it, it offers great protection now that consumers quite like, but there's other ways of doing that, as we know, and we need to we need to carry on with that agenda as, as an example. And uh, I'm quite convinced that's where we're going to come out. Well, and 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 Davina, I mean Klaus, thank you. Um, and you ended almost in in the waste pocket. So, Davina, <laughs> as a waste management company, <laughs> tell me, do we produce more waste, less waste? Um, do you see this as perhaps an an opportunity more than than a crisis? Um, thinking about circular economy, um, uh, other things. Tell us a little bit about what do you think from a waste management point of view when something like this ha hits us? Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me, Hella, and, and the Ethical Corporation. And I agree, I'm so happy to see so many attendees on, on this wonderful panel and happy to be part of the rest of the group here. It's a it's a very intriguing topic and, and one that's certainly central waste management is thinking about and the service that we provide. Um, we've already talked about the fact that essential services tend to be thinking about things a little bit differently than other companies like airlines and hospitality as examples. And with waste management's central focus on keeping our communities healthy and safe, 
we are an essential service and, and we provide a service that is fundamental to the long-term viability of our communities. And waste management puts that at the center of everything we do, including our focus on ensuring that our employees, um, much like Rebecca's comments earlier, can continue to serve their communities in a safe and healthy way with the backdrop of a pandemic, which has been our top priority because keeping our people safe and healthy, uh, it positions them to care for our customers and our communities. In terms of whether or not there will be more waste or less waste in, in this environment and as we build back stronger, um, you know, traditionally speaking, waste flows cycle with economic indicators like GDP and um, unemployment and housing starts and population growth. And so all of those indicators will tell us that we're probably going into a dramatically different waste backdrop. We've already seen double digit declines in waste streams in a number of important areas. But our business is thinking about this, not just for today, but really for the long term. And I, I think the, the comments uh, about circular economy and sustainability are all central to how we think about waste flows because we are a full service environmental company. We pick up the garbage on the curbside, we recycle uh, a great deal of the waste that we all generate and then what cannot be repurposed or reused is then disposed and it's our job to make sure that we are protecting the environment at every step of, of that journey and on, on the front lines Waste management has seen, uh, many people aren't necessarily thinking about this, but with the world working from home, our trucks are able to run their routes more efficiently than they ever have. Um, and so if, if we all reset and reconsider a, a more dramatic work from home environment, could that mean a, a more efficient workplace going forward? And, and that's certainly one of our hopes. Um, recycling in this environment, our domestic uh, manufacturers need more of our material. As we've seen declines in waste flows in the commercial lines of business, with small businesses in particular seeing slowdowns in their business, we are seeing a shift in where waste is generated. So waste is generally in our small business at the highest levels and we've seen you know about a 15% decline in those waste streams. but at the same time the increase in container weights at our homes are up 15 to 25 percent and so what we have to recognize is that those small businesses tend to be better at a, a cleaner recycling stream and as residents, we are the worst um, when it comes to providing a clean recycling stream. So waste management has to be, uh, you know, more than ever focused on educating all of us to be better recyclers so that we can supply those domestic manufacturers who rely on our recycled content in order to make their products, their tissues, their paper boards um, and the like. And we've all heard about paper shortages and the like, and, and we need to do our part as recyclers on the front lines, as consumers, to be sure that we keep those supply chains fed and, and going. We've seen a, you know, a, a dramatic increase in the amount of recycled content that is going domestically. So waste management, before COVID-19 was selling about 70% of our recycled content in domestic markets. Now that's up to 80 to 85% and we expect that that could continue to grow. But it's up to all of us on the front lines to be sure that the, the supply chain is full and that we're... I think, did Davina freeze for everybody or just for me? Uh, yeah. For everybody. Davina, yeah. we'll Davina. come back to you. Oh, maybe, maybe not. I'm going, Davina, I'm going to to uh, go to some of these questions because, and also in terms of the small businesses that I did hear you, you talk about. But there are questions coming in here, and one of them are very concrete. What are the panelists doing to implement coherent metrics on quantifying, believe me, 
you are CFOs quantifying the non-financial. And that's Peter, Peter Burgers, who is asking that. But I better go to, um, I better go to a CFO. Terry, what are you doing? What are these coherent metrics? Look, I, think, actually I think it's a great question. And I think a big part of what we're going to see moving forward is more reporting on these non-financial metrics. And actually going back to what is the role of the CFO in helping to drive the sustainability agenda. If you can't measure it, you can't value it. And as we're looking at uh, how to drive capital towards businesses that prioritize sustainability, that take care of the long term, that think about the, the broader range of stakeholders, yes, reporting and finding ways to um, report uh, in a consistent and accurate manner is gonna be really important. That said, I think there's still lots of challenges around non-financial reporting and whereas we have developed really over 50 to 100 years um, approaches to accounting that are relatively standardized that you can now pick up a set of financial accounts and pretty quickly understand what they're saying we're nowhere near that in terms of from a sustainability perspective so look i i, I think that there are a number of initiatives with the world goal council have developed responsible gold mining principles that speak to gold mining companies and that requires mandatory disclosure, external assurance, the sorts of things that we're used to seeing in the financial setting, applying those to the non-financial setting, uh, looking at climate change and, and emissions and just getting uh, a better agreed methodology as to how you calculate uh, carbon emissions, particularly scope three, that's the uh, upstream and downstream emissions that aren't directly under your control or the energy you use. There's a lot of work to do to actually get to a consistent methodology, but we need to start somewhere. And so for me, uh, I'm seeing more reporting. Uh, we're encouraging more reporting from companies in the gold supply chain, uh, but let everybody be clear, it's going to be a path to get convergence, to get completely comparable data um, Look, it's, it's not dissimilar to the bond markets where it's uh, taken 30 years to get bond ratings to be roughly aligned and there are three leading providers and you can trust what you see. We're not there yet in sustainability and that's a big issue um, in terms of allocating capital. But more, more is happening, more disclosure is taking place. Uh, and as long as that helps build this confidence and often you need to have use the tools that we've learned from the finance sector, external assurance and, and, and that rigor that approaches it, then that will lead us to getting more comparable, accurate data that will absolutely lead to more capital being redirected to more sustainable businesses. Thanks, Terry. And, and um, Klaus, I know you, you're part of Accounting for Sustainability and I also sit in the, the global expert panel there. Um, but you're also a private company. So if we get to reporting and what it is that you as a private company should report, why should you do this in the first place? You don't have, well, you do have shareholders, but you don't have the, it on, on uh, the Wall Street or anywhere else. Uh, no, thank you. I mean, I, I agree with everything that, uh, you know, that, that, that Terry said. Uh, yeah, we're a private company, but uh, we've, got, we've got very, uh, uh, Active shareholders were as well in, you know, frankly, the business that they want to own, um, and and you know, the way we want to run that today for the world that we want to see tomorrow is is, and and they are very purpose-led and principle-led led families. So, uh, I, I think I got I got much earlier and much more uh, interrogation uh, or we as a C-suite on what we're doing on our sustainability agenda than probably. You know uh, some public uh, you know, companies but nevertheless clearly reporting sometimes can can be lagging in a in, in a private company i think terry to share the same point of view i have engaged myself this is also why i, I made us join you know a4s uh, because it, it sort of uh, you know it puts a it puts a little bit of a stick in the ground that uh, you know I, I you know forced myself to also get more involved and, and learn from other companies because it isn't not necessarily the easiest area and, and, and yes we need to get much better accounting type standard way on measuring things because this is the way you can really 
put it into the market, uh, you know, dynamics and so on. Um, I, I think, though, there's many other things, you know, one can still do. And, and you know, I, I think we are fortunate with what I just said about our shareholders. And, and we are really holding ourselves accountable already for much more than, you know, financial measures. And we've, we've crafted it into what we call the mass compass, which I, I see as, I call it holistic or purpose-led you know, value creation where, you know, yes, of course, there needs to be an economic engine, there needs to be a vibrant business that is growing and innovating, and those are clearly metrics. But we also need to put measures around, you know, what we call positive societal impact, which is the broad sustainability agenda, which, you know, uh, which is as much about livelihood in our supply chain as it is about our, our carbon footprint, etc. And then you know, we need to be seen as a trusted partner, you know, in, in, in the world. And those are those are things that we are driving. And and one of my key philosophies and what I am trying to lead for and how I involve myself also as a CFO, some may say late, but never better better late than never, is is really we've got to bring this whole agenda much closer into the individual business strategies. Um, you know, we, you know, we're good at talking about capabilities and brand building and innovation pipeline and all sorts of things that needs to happen in all of these business cells that we have. Uh, I think uh, bringing the sustainability agenda much closer, the ESG agenda closer to that, and making it a prerequisite in the investment thesis of why that is a business that is A, worth B, B, being in and B, can provide you know a uh, you know a good return in the end of the day and create value um is, is is critical and and i think that is a way to uh, also get resource allocated uh you know inside companies which i think is equally challenging probably to, to some of the, uh, the the external factors that we discussed so that, that's how we're thinking about it Thanks, Lars. And, and Rebecca, I mean, from a, a private to a public company, but where you had your former CEO, Paul Pullman, went out and said, okay, why are we reporting every quarter uh, to, to you know, the, the shareholders? Um, and there's a question coming in, and there was a little bit about also what we talked about before, that, well, if the consumers are not willing to pay for for the products, the, the more sustainable products. Well, you're not going to have the income to do all of the other things. So how do you balance that, you know, going out to, to the market, ensuring at the same time you actually have the, the finance in order to finance a, a, a sustainable future and, and your ESG plans? And so, so as you can imagine, we, we've done a, a lot of, of research and work in this area. So I think just, just to take your questions in, in two parts. So when um, when Alan Job took over as CEO from Paul, you know, one of his big objectives was to end this debate about is sustainable business good business? Because, and, we'll, and I'll come on to some of the work that we've done to show that, but you know, it, it is non-sustainable business good business. And it obviously, obviously it isn't. You know, I think we've seen, and COVID's really accentuated that, the interconnection between the environment, the social and the economic, and they're not three distinct different areas that you can look at in, in, in metrics if you're looking for long-term sustainable growth. So certainly, you know, a lot of the work that we've done over the past few years has been trying to really push for um, integrating those key ESG metrics. So, you know, we're one of the first companies, for example, with TCFD, with, with the task force on climate-related financial disclosure, to use that framework to really understand the financial impacts of climate change in our business. So, you know, what would that mean, for example, when we're growing tea in uh, in Kenya? And what that might mean when we're sourcing tomatoes in, in in southern Spain? You know, how would how do we mitigate against that? And I think we've done quite a lot of work, and I know others on the phone uh, on the call today um, have been involved in groups like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development or the World Economic Forum at the moment, who are working on trying to standardise non-financial metrics right across a whole sectors which you know as we were talking about a couple of minutes ago you know is not straightforward it's really challenging but i think actually it's, you know, it, it is essential and the reason that we believe in that so so vociferously you asked teller about consumers 
one of the big things that we've done over the past 10 years at Unilever under the auspices of what we call the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan is to develop um, a growth trust risk cost matrix when we're looking at the business value of sustainability. So we've done a raft of research with different, different consumer groups, different countries, you know, different socioeconomic status to look at how those four factors will influence how we run and operate the company and what that means for, for sustainability. So one of the biggest things that we can do if we really want to make sustainable living commonplace is to bring that to life through our brands because consumers make choices based on the brands and what they perceive and think about that brand, you know, and then obviously the parent company behind it. So we've seen time and time again, when we put sustainability at the heart of the consumer proposition. So if you think about, for example, brands like Dove or brands like Ben & Jerry, they are our fastest growing brands because consumers very much take a you know a 360 approach now when they're choosing the products that they want to buy so you know if they're looking at a brand like dove and they really genuinely subscribe and believe in what they say about redefining beauty or they look at a brand like ben and jerry's and the work that they do around climate change and advocacy groups on the ground and really trying to start consumer movements consumers will choose those brands because they believe in what they stand for so we know undoubtedly that there is a link into growth you know, and again, it's a link into trust. You know, when I look now at Unilever and I'm sometimes involved in, in the recruitment that we do, particularly with the graduate trainees, we're the number one graduate recruiter now in 50 different markets. And the reason that a lot of the grads want to come and work at Unilever is because they want to work in a company that puts sustainability front and center. You know, so for us, it is a real talent acquisition tool as well, because I like to think that we're, you know, driving the best people to want to come and work for us. And then I think of, of course, you know, you can't in the long term, and people don't pay more for sustainable products. You're absolutely right. So sometimes you know, the risk and the cost metric when I'm looking at the sustainability uh, metrics as a business driver. So, for example, in supply chain, there may be initially a small on cost when we're setting up sustainable sourcing for key crops and commodities. But I can absolutely guarantee that in the long term, that will end up saving us money. You know, if we can guarantee security of supply for key crops and commodities by building out a sustainable sourcing supply chain, so thinking about the livelihoods of the farmers, boosting the agricultural production um, and the quality and value of that crop or commodity, and then telling the story, so for example, sustainably sourced vanilla now in, in, in all of our ice cream brands, again, we know that that will resonate into consumer choice, but it saves us money. You know, we swapped to um, uh, renewable energy across all of Unilever sites. You know, again, initially, there may have been a small on cost over the long term now. We know that that's going to save us money. So I think that growth trust risk cost model and then look at how you bring that to life through your consumer facing brands and making sure that you articulate that proposition in a way that relates to the target market that does lead to growth. You start talking like a CFO now. Um, <laughs> so. So, and, and but, but just, to add, just, to add on, but, but just to add on that, you know, I, I, I do work very closely with, with, with the CFO and the finance team because, you know, I'm, you know, I, I know that Terry and Davina and Klaus would all agree. Actually, you know, if, if it doesn't make commercial sense in the long term, it isn't by nature sustainable. So, so, you know, I think it's really important that this misnomer that sustainability means CSR and, and, and charity giving is dismissed because it's not. It's taking a multi-stakeholder model so that ultimately you're bringing you know, economic and social benefit right the way across your value chain. It's not just about doing no harm. It's actually about doing good in the world, but doing good in a way that, that benefits and, and grows the company. And I think you, you, know, you can't separate them out. And it drives me potty sometimes when people say, well, you know, it's really nice that you do that work, but, you know, it's not good for the business. And, and it is, you know, we can, we can demonstrate that time and time again. Yes. Uh, and, and I think we, maybe we should just re give you all a new title, uh, Chief Value Creation Officers. <laughs> um, there you go. Um, and, and that gives me, there's actually a question for, this says for C or two CSOs, but Davina, I think I'm going to put it to you because if we look at right now, um, and, and we at we're competent boards, we went out and asked all of these 75 global leaders that we are working with, board members, et cetera. If you look at what are the, the, also the stakeholders that are most important right now, 
Um, and one of the questions that came in was like, have that changed? Have it changed from, you know, Rebecca, you were saying talent, et cetera. And, and I, I have heard from many, well, suddenly it's the very close. And then, we, then we're working on that. But maybe, Davina, from, from your point of view, what happened when this hit, was this crisis hit? Who were the first one you were thinking of and, and, and what happened then? You know, what's so interesting is we had a change in our CEO four years ago or so now. And one of the first things that Jim did as CEO is really ask us to focus on what our commitments and values were. What was our why and our purpose? And waste management very intentionally put people first. And we've been talking for the last several years about what people first means. And to waste management, we're, we're not serving less stakeholders by putting our people first. We just recognize that by putting waste management employees at the beginning of the line, from a stakeholder management perspective, our employees will better serve our customers, better care for our communities, better care for the environment, and all of those things ultimately benefit the shareholder. And we have effectively seen COVID-19 amplify that commitment. And waste management has recognized with the backdrop of the pandemic, the need to take care of our team. And our members are, um, you know, I enjoyed Re Rebecca's comments about the fact that when you have a purpose-driven brand and a, a brand that is putting sustainability first, it makes a difference in how you engage with both your current employees and then prospective employees. I think that we are seeing, particularly in the back offices, um, you know, a, a real focus from graduates and professionals who are looking for an organization to be part of that they can believe in. And when sustainability and putting people at the beginning of the stakeholder line is something that is core and central to your why and your purpose, I, I think all of the rest of um, stakeholder management will flow effectively from there. And it may seem disconnected from traditional value creation. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Hala, um, we're all value creators in a lot of ways. You know, for a CFO, I think the dollars and cents were always at the beginning of the line, but I can tell you from where I sit, when I make um, with the rest of our senior leadership team collective decisions about what our focus is both today and over the long term, it's ensuring that it's connected with the long term vision and strategy and commitment to our people and our purpose uh, that is really at the top of the line in terms of that decision making. We also clearly are going to anticipate things like risk and change in the environment and how we should be thinking about not just what our customers and our communities need from us today, but what they will need for the next decade and, and thereafter. And so ultimately, I think when you consider the organization's purpose as, as the first commitment that you have, um, and then now the economics and the risk mitigation to follow, you can make decisions that are good from um, a value creation and value preservation perspective for your team and for your shareholders. And, and if I may just add to that, look, I think COVID has actually created the opportunity for businesses to demonstrate that the, the impact that they have on employees and communities and broader society. And, and the World Gold Council, we're a membership association. Our members are, are the world's leading gold mining companies. I've heard lots of stories of these are mines operating often in remote parts of the world where there aren't very well developed healthcare systems. The companies have always played a role in providing healthcare. Now that just becomes even more increased and, and important, both in uh, managing healthcare directly, but also in education and in helping people understand what's going on in the local community. And that's the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do, but it's the right thing to do also because to all the point, points that have been made earlier, you build those communities around you, you get the support from the communities that you're a part of, it makes your business much more sustainable in a financial sense, as well as in the, the sense of 
just it, it's doing a, the right thing and doing a good thing. So I think now is a really interesting time for businesses to go back and look again at purpose and to use the role that businesses have been asked to do or not even asked to do have stepped into the breach often because there's a need for businesses to play a very meaningful role in helping everybody in society work through the challenges that we're going through today it, it helps redefine expectations of what businesses should be doing and i think that's really positive and i think we can build from that I, I love it, Terry, and I, I, I took the, those of you who can see the, the sustainable development goals and companies to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And, and I think what I hear from all of you is that, that this, is, this is not a being a CSO or CFO, or this is about being a business leader. Um, and, and I think we have a lot of leaders out there listening to us right now. And I want to make sure that there's a call to action as well. Um, we, we have a question from, uh, I think it was Philip I saw somewhere here that said, you know, um, and now I'm paraphrasing because there's so many questions. Um, how can I convince my CFO to also understand that this is important? Um, and and perhaps you know I can I can start by asking uh, now, so Davina, how do you how did you get convinced? And and is there a good advice to people that sit right now and say my CFO is just pressing no 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 budget budget for anything? What what would you go and say if you should convince yourself? Klaus, do you want to start? I was muted. Sorry. I was going to say you need to you need to go to somebody else and try and get rid of the CFO. That's a good starting point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, with, with the risk of you know of, of of repeating you know what has been already you know said, but I I I, I, I think you know where I mean I think you know Unilever, for instance, has done you know great work and and, and on the model that. You, you talk about I I personally see that get that and wholeheartedly subscribe to that uh, I, I couldn't necessarily tell you how I, I got there but I, I I think you know you just need to look at the next generation of people and you need to look at what is going around you in the statistics and it, it's evident that it's a it, it's it's a movement and it's the right thing to Take a responsible approach to, and it's the right thing because it actually ensures that you are in business going forward and can provide jobs, opportunities, education, uh, you know, and 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 basic needs for everybody that either work for you or or, or benefit from your company services. So, uh, you know, it, it, we have we have moved from an old world where, uh, you know, you know it. it of how you build a brand or how you build a business to to a new world where I think ESG is an integral part of the way, you know, a growing, maybe not enough still, you know, uh, consumer base is is, uh, is 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 having a need uh, for for you to play a responsible role and uh, like many things, you know, this year is an S curve too, no doubt. Once there is enough critical mass or penetration, you know, this becomes the norm, you know, and if you don't play to those rules, you're not in business anymore. And consumers are actually first talent, and then consumers will walk from your franchise. And, uh, but, you know, I think that's, that's the story that, and, you know, and I, I come back to this thing, it's simple, stupid, but you've got to make it a part of the individual business models. Uh, and and if you don't manage to convince yourself for that that's the case, well then it will be this thing we do good on the side that Rebecca talks about, and that that is kind of always in the bucket of things that end up being being cut when it's a tough year or being being named and shamed as what's the return on this, and we're just doing this for for reputation reasons and. Um, and that's that's just the wrong approach. Um, so I really believe in, and I think this is also how we're doing it at Mars. 
increasingly so you don't bring it back into the center of the debate um, and not be an add-on. Um, and, and I think everything that has been said by the other panelists here in terms of the facts around what's going on in, in the world and the role this place is, is how you got to, you've got to convince me those facts. So, and, and, and Klaus and Divina, I'll come back to you, but but I want to see in terms of government, so, so we have questions coming in, what's the role of the government here? Because now we're sitting here and saying, oh yes, and I say, you can all be leaders and you can also help build this back. But we also have government, we have a lot of money that's being put out to big businesses, small businesses, individuals at the moment. W what's the role of government in all this? And, and Klaus, I just picked on you, but if any of you, you want to kind of like come in on that. Um. Well, I can make a comment because if, if you think about waste management services and, and how we um, interact with our communities, in large part, it is about public-private partnership and engaging with our municipalities and governments in order to advance the health and safety of our communities. And sustainability has been at the center of that, particularly in markets where you can think about on our coasts in particular, where um, consumers are demanding sustainability to be at the forefront of the service that we provide. And what we know right now is that government, in particularly local, in particular local governments are finding funding shortages and they're going to be um, more constrained than they've been in the last several years and those economic constraints are going to be significant in terms of their ability to make commitments to sustainability and so what we have to think about is the balance of public-private partnerships that has existed and really fueled some of this investment over the last several years what kind of rebalancing needs to exist so that we don't slow down that progress and that investment on the environmental sustainability side as our municipalities have funding shortages and, and constraints. And that's something that we're starting to think through. Overall, the, the one thing that I wanted to come back to on the earlier comments is one of convi conviction and focus. And I think everything that we've talked about, really, it, it gets executed upon when leadership teams and organizations culturally find a way to be convicted and focused on the things that matter and, and what defines their purpose. And I, you know, Terry was mentioning at the beginning of our session, decisions that investors are making from a capital allocation perspective organizations are making capital allocation decisions as well and as a CFO it's my part of my responsibility to make sure that when we're allocating our capital that we're doing so in a way that is intentionally convicted and focused on the matter most to us and I think that's what public private partnerships are going to have to find as well as they have less resources in the near term. Thanks, Davina. And, and I, I couldn't. I was thinking, okay. Sorry, sorry no. Rebecca. No, I, I was just going to add. You know, something I come to the fore over over this past three or four months, and we all knew it, but you know, it's just been exacerbated. Is if, if business and and the private sector and you know government, we all have to work together in civil society. And I certainly think you know when you look at some of the stimulus packages. That are being launched at the moment you know in, in in europe obviously there was the green deal that was launched in in december well when you look now at some of the COVID recovery packages in place actually you know this this is the time to really motivate and help countries with the green transition there's a ton of work i know the, the smith school at oxford released some research earlier this month that looked at projects which cut greenhouse gas emissions as well as stimulating economic growth, will end up delivering higher returns on, on government spending in the short and in the long term. You know, so you're helping countries and enabling them to invest in renewable energy. You know, now is the time that we can do this. You know, ironically, during this awful and massively upsetting period of, of, of the past three or four months, you know, we've all seen and benefited from cleaner skies. There's been less traffic on the road. You know, we've seen nature blossoming. You know, and it's been at the most heart-wrenching and upsetting moment. But you realise actually. A bit of collective action from employees in an enabling environment 
that can take the lessons that we've learned and translate them into something positive from the government, you know, I, I'd like to think, you know, will be the way forward. And of course, you know, the hand in hand with that, it's not just about the environment, is around social. And I think the more that the government can help the private sector with training and redevelopment programs, getting people back into employment, one, you know, one of the biggest things we can do in the private sector is to help to provide jobs and guarantee livelihoods for people and you know, it really try to get the economy going again and i think you know to, that's a really really important part of the of, of the government stimulus packages that are coming out at the moment i, I completely agree and i can't i mean my, my day job is to train both board of directors and those that want to be board of directors and investors etc and and to me it's also a question about do we speak the same language um, I mean, Klaus and I can speak Danish together, but <laughs> how much I would scream it, probably the rest of you would not really understand, right? So how do we learn that? And, and I see a lot of people coming to us to say, okay, we don't, our CFO might be one, but our, our board of directors, our investors, yes, we talk about this, but, but do they really understand this? So, so perhaps back to the question, and I think it was Philip that, that asked that question of, how do I get to convince my my CFO? But also, perhaps both from you, Terry, and, and Rebecca's point of view, and Terry, I'm picking you here. What is it the sustainability people should should also go and and do and say? And I think both Klaus and Davina was also and Rebecca. You know, this is about being strategic, but it's also bigger bigger play. Can they go and say you can be part of something that's bigger than just a company? This is a societal change. Sure, it is a societal change. And the, the, the sustainable development goals that you pulled up earlier are a really important driver towards that. And business has a critical role to play. Just going back to the previous question, what do the governments have? The role of governments is, for me, a big part of government's role is to enable businesses to advance the, the, the towards the sustainable development goals. Look, we, we talk quite a lot around um, how to convince those who perhaps are, are, are not there. Ultimately, uh, this really does come down to long-term sustainability for your business. And if you want to be able to have customers, have investors, have em the employees that you want as a business that are going to serve you well over the longer term, you have to recognize that society expectations have changed and that you are going to only get the customers, investors, and, and uh, employees and communities that, that you want if you invest in it, and, and that becomes a, a financial decision. I think it's ultimately as, as simple as that. It is a business decision. It's not a sustainability decision. I agree with that. Well said, Terry. Exactly what we have to think yeah, about. We are up on the last minute, so um, so I, I think well said, Terry. Um, any any very last comments before I think Ed will come and, and throw out us here? Nope. Ed, do you want to um, say something to all, all the fantastic attendees here? Yeah, I'll reappear. Uh, well, firstly, thank you everyone for listening today and thanks to our panelists as well. Um, and special thanks to Hella, sorry, as well for moderating the webinar and for World Goal Council who have been partnering with us today. Um, the next bit of content we're producing, we have our Responsible Business Summit Week um, virtual, which is taking place on June 8th and 16th. Uh, if you're interested in learning more um, about the speakers and the topics we'll be covering there, you need to go to events.ethicalcorp.com forward slash RBS hyphen virtual. Um, thanks very much for listening and uh, see you all next time. And thank you to my panelists. Vir virtual clap and virtual high five. Thank you. <laughs> high five. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Bye. all. Bye.